Okay, well, first of all, everyone, welcome to the very first lecture of the uh, UV Club. Um, and uh, the motivation for this is there's a lot of, um, so even if belated <laughs> resurgence in the UV astronomy, um, uh, it's, it's like extra astronomy it can't be done from ground. And yet, uh, if you want to study the interstellar medium um, and all related things that go with it uh, of any sort of gas stuff, UV is the, is the band of interest because that's where all the resonance lines lie. Um, and um, there's been a lot of push on infrared, as we can see from Spitzer and you know, uh, JWST and Roman telescope, uh, which is all fine. Uh, but uh, this is where I think the action really is. Uh, in some sense, infrared is getting uh, you know crowded. Um, so it's. Um, the purpose of this uh, club is to educate ourselves. We will call uh, eminent uh, uh, astronomers who know the field, uh, who will give leisurely one hour long talks. Uh, then we have a leisurely half hour to discuss. So this is not going to be the typical Zoom conference where you have 20 minute talks. I never understand what the purpose of that is actually. It takes a while to develop a concept. Um, and, um, so, uh, and this will be recorded uh, unless the speaker objects. Um, so some of our students uh, are in India and some are in China and Japan. And so they can't necessarily always attend because of time zone issues, so it'll be recorded. Um, and uh, um, uh, I hope uh, you'll find it useful and uh, continue to attend uh, uh, subsequent talks. Uh, today's speaker is a Professor Jank Murthy, who is a senior professor at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bengaluru, in India. Um, he is known uh, primarily uh, for his very long standing interest and work on the diffuse UV background, both FUV and NUV. I would say, kind of, we tend to associate that um, field with Jank. <clears throat> He did his PhD at Johns Hopkins University, uh, working under uh, R. Henry. I suspect that's where he got bitten by the, uh, the UV background. And uh, then went off to uh, Goddard Space Flight Center uh, for a postdoc and was a research scientist at JHU, uh, working partly with MSX and with uh, FUSE. Uh, returned to India and essentially has been at IA uh, of Indian Institute of Astrophysics uh, sort of ever since. Um, and Jant has always some innovative ideas how to do things uh, inexpensively. Uh, it's not very easy to push such radical ideas in old uh, bureaucracies. Um, and I'm sure he'll end his talk with some uh, yet another new idea. And hopefully one of them will take off in just the same way I was just talking with uh, Yatsu san in Japan. Finally, you know, one of the smaller telescopes that has taken off. Uh, we'll hear about that too soon. Uh, Jayant, all yours. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, uh, with uh, with Sri and Delaria's permission, I uh, I know I was supposed to talk about UVIT, but uh, I, I thought since this was the first talk, and since I don't really enjoy giving uh, postcard sessions anyway. I wanted to make it a more pedagogical talk and so talk a little more about, uh, about UV astronomy and, uh, and what we do in it, including the instruments. So, and I know that there are, there are UV experts in it. I see Chris is, is there, but there are also people who are not as familiar with the UV. So let me start by defining what the ultraviolet is. And so essentially the wavelength regions are defined by technology. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. But, uh, I, and the names can uh, differ depending on the mission. So uh, you have the far ultraviolet spectroscopic explorer fuse, where the FUV is defined by the far ultraviolet is defined as being between uh, uh, 912 and, uh, and uh, 1200 angstroms. And uh, you have the FUV detector in Galax, 
which where the FUV is defined as being between about 1500, uh, let's say 1300 and uh, 1800. But these are broad definitions. And, uh, and so EUV, anything shortward of uh, 912 angstroms, FUV, let's say 912 to 1200, the NUV from 1,200 to, uh, to about uh, 3,000 angstroms. And all of this you call the vacuum ultraviolet from about uh, 912 to 3,200 angstroms. And uh, the, the UV, in order to observe the UV, of course, you need to go into space uh, because the ozone layer absorbs all the, all the ultraviolet. Now, the first UV observations were made from uh, V2 rockets. Operation Paperclip brought the German rocket scientists to Huntsville, uh, the, the Marshall, Marshall Space Flight Center. And the first of the UV observations, I think the first UV observation of astronomical observation was uh, this observation of the sun by uh, Tauzi and all from a V2 rocket. Uh, he was at NRL and many of these first sounding rockets were at NRL. So, the, the sounding rockets, sounding rockets, rockets that go up and come back down, they, uh, they made the first observations in ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray astronomy, and so on. But uh, when NASA decided that they wanted to go into space astronomy or, or uh, yeah, go into science to do space astronomy, there was uh, some discussion about uh, whether they should do UV astronomy or X-ray astronomy. And uh, they decided that uh, UV astronomy was the way to go because they felt that uh, UV astronomy was much more relatable to the uh, ground-based uh, optical astronomers. They thought they would attract more people. And so uh, why, why do we do the UV? Well, as Sri said, the UV has uh, most of the electronic transitions of atoms and molecules. So if you want to do real physics, if you want to do spectroscopy, you, you get the maximum return from the UV. And this is uh, one of the charts from the FUSE proposal where they showed how, how, they, they showed how much more dense the uh, spectral lines were in the, in, in the FUSE range. When, when you look at the UV, and, and this is something that, uh, that, that, that's a big contrast from optical astronomy, there, there are only a few tens of thousands of stars in the UV that are visible in the sky, uh, a, few, a few tens of thousands of sources. So in the visible, you'll see all these uh, red stars, uh, G stars and, and, and M stars. In the, vis in the UV, all you see are O and B stars. A stars in the, in the near UV, but in the further UV, only, uh, only the O and B stars. So the star density is much lower. And if you want to do things like model the interstellar radiation field or model dust scattering, you can do it feasibly just by counting stars. You don't, actually, you don't even have to model the stars. And so what you see in the UV are, are young stars. You see O and B stars. So you're looking at star formation regions. And this was one of the big motivations for GALAX, the Galaxy Evolution Explorer. It was to look at, uh, at star formation regions in the uh, nearby universe. So if I were to go through the different regions, the EUV is, uh, as, as I said, about 70 angstroms to 912 angstroms. The lower limit is uh, defined by more or less uh, grazing act angle optics. As you, if you go much shorter, then, then you can't use normal incidence optics anymore. And the upper limit is the, is the hydrogen ionization. So this plot here is the cross section of, uh, of, of the interstellar medium. The wave, uh, it goes to shorter wavelengths to the right. And so here is the Lyman alpha ionization peak. And so the, you can see here that uh, the, the uh, uh, cross section is about 10 to the minus 17 atoms, uh, 10 to the 17, atoms per centimeter, uh, centimeter squared. Uh, so what it tells you is that if you go out to a column density of about 10 to the 17, you get to an optical depth of one in, in uh, hydrogen. And 10 to the 17 is basically out to the edge of the solar system. So there's not very much further out that you can see. 
And uh, even, even though there was a satellite in this range, the Extreme Ultraviolet uh, Explorer out of Berkeley, the, you, you can only see the nearest white dwarfs. They did manage to see a, a few extragalactic sources if you look up to the galactic poles, but there's really not much that you can see in, the, in, in our galaxy. So as you go longward of uh, 912 angstroms, now 912 angstroms is the hydrogen ionization, and then 1216 angstroms is uh, Lyman alpha. Because you want to go down as far as 912 angstroms, you have to use windowless detectors. And if you use windowless detectors, that means that you have many more contamination issues that get much harder to handle. But the biggest problem is that, uh, is that you can't block out Lyman alpha. So this is a spectrum of the diffuse ultraviolet background from the ALICE spectrograph on, uh, on New Horizons. And uh, here's Lyman alpha. And much of the scattering, much of this uh, signal over that whole spectrum is from Lyman alpha scattering. If you go to the near ultraviolet, longward of uh, 1200 angstroms, so now you can start to use filters to block off the Lyman alpha. So a calcium fluoride filter will block off anything shortward of 1250 angstroms. If you use a barium fluoride filter, you'll block off anything shortward of 1350 angstroms. Uh, quartz is, I think sapphire is 1450, quartz is 1600. And so you can cut off increasingly shorter and shorter wavelengths. And so this is a, a image that shows you all of the different contributors to the near ultraviolet, to the, to the wavelength range between 1200 and 3200 angstroms. So this is an image from uh, UVX, the ultraviolet experiment, experiment that uh, it was a, a combined experiment from uh, uh, Berkeley, which uh, Chris, was, uh, Chris was on, Chris Martin, uh, Chris Martin and Mark Hurwitz, and between Hopkins, where uh, this, this was in the early days of the space shuttle program. And so in those days, NASA thought that they would do all space missions through the space shuttle program. So uh, uh, they, wouldn't put out, they wouldn't have to launch rockets into, into low Earth orbit anymore to get above the atmosphere. Instead, everything would be sent up by the space shuttle. So we were put together on what's called a getaway special, which is basically a, a big garbage can and they took us up on the shuttle and uh, we observed for, uh, I don't know if I, I think about a week and a half or two weeks. And then they brought us back down and we, we got our data. And so this, uh, this is an image from, from one of our spectrographs or from both of our spectrographs. We had, an, we had one spectrograph covering the range between 1200 and uh, 1800 angstroms and another spectrograph between 1800 and 3200 angstroms. And so what you see here is wavelength is along the x-axis, 1200 angstroms to 3200 angstroms, and time is along the y-axis. So here we're just getting into orbital night, and here we're just getting into leaving orbital night. This is Lyman alpha. It's uh, the brightest source in any uh, observation from, 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 uh, from, from the Earth. And uh, even though we had a calcium fluoride filter, enough of the Lyman alpha got through that, that, uh, that we still saw it. This is oxygen at 1304 angstroms, which shows up as we get into orbital night, orbital twilight. And then you see traces as we get up into orbital dawn. And this is uh, oxygen 1356. But you see that there's nothing for uh, uh, around orbital midnight. There's no air glow emission other than Lyman alpha around orbital midnight in the FUV. We had a, a wiring problem in the detectors. We had a, we had a, a intermittent uh, short circuit. And so we had a lot more noise in the near ultraviolet detector. Uh, but you can see that in the far ultraviolet, there's almost no dark noise at all. It's very, very dark. So most of what you see is just the interstellar background. You see some faint stars here. You can see the stars uh, more prominently in the, in the near ultraviolet, but maybe you can see some trails going out into the FUV. As you go to longer wavelengths, uh, as I said, this, uh, the brighter background is largely because of uh, dark noise because, because we had a loose contact. But uh, you, can see the, uh, you, you can see these stellar trails as we pass over stars. 
And you can see that it gets brighter towards longer wavelengths. As we get closer to, to the visible, the zodiacal light starts coming in. That's uh, starlight, uh, sunlight scattered by, by interplanetary dust grains. And so somewhere around uh, 28 or 2,800 angstroms or so, the zodiacal light starts to pick up. These two lines, uh, we don't really know what they are, but we identified them with magnesium, a couple of magnesium lines here. And this is nitric oxide as we get into the, uh, uh, get out of darkness. So now when you have uh, UV instruments, throughout the UV, you can just use the, the same techniques that you would use in the optical. You have normal incidence mirrors. Uh, you, the, the main difference is that you have to be careful about your materials. So you wanna minimize the number of elements. You, uh, you wanna minimize the number of, uh, uh, you, wanna, uh, uh, you, you wanna maximize the reflections and minimize the number of refractions. Uh, your mirror reflectivity is typically around 80% 80, 80 longward of 1200 angstroms. And you usually use aluminum mirrors, but you have to put a mag fluoride coating because if you don't, uh, uh, the aluminum oxidizes immediately and uh, aluminum oxide has no reflectivity in the UV. So you, you need uh, aluminum with a mag fluoride coating. And that gives you typically about 80% uh, efficiency. If you want to go shortward of uh, Lyman alpha, then uh, you can't use magnesium fluoride. So uh, uh, Fuse, for instance, use silica, silicon carbide mirrors, which give you about 40 or 50% efficiency in that wavelength range. And depending on uh, what wavelengths you're interested in, you can use different crystalline filters, each of which has a reflection, has a transmission coefficient, I mean, transmission, uh, a probability of about 80%. So if you're, if you're interested in looking at Lyman Alpha, for instance, IUE, the International Ultraviolet Explorer, you can uh, coat your optics with magnesium fluoride and uh, that'll get you down to about 1150 angstroms. If, you're, if you don't want Lyman Alpha, typically for us who look at the diffuse ultraviolet background, uh, if we allow Lyman Alpha in, it'll swamp our entire, uh, our entire field, then we would use calcium fluoride or barium fluoride. The detectors are, uh, uh, you, you, I, I know you have a couple of talks coming up on, uh, on different kinds of detectors, but the detectors that have been the workhorses of UV astronomy have been intensified uh, detectors of one kind or another. So the kind that's in uh, the uh, UVIT the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, UV telescope on Astrosat is, uh, is an MCP, uh, is an intensified MCP detector with a CMOS uh, sensor. Now we would, uh, we originally tried to get, uh, tried to get uh, 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 electronic detectors from, uh, uh, from, from Aussie Sigmund, but it turns out that these are uh, these were too difficult to, for us to get into because they're all under ITAR, and so after trying for a year, uh, we we just gave up. So we finally did get our detectors from Fotec in England, and a typical cost of a detector is uh, uh, if you don't want it space qualified, we can get a detector for about uh, twenty or thirty thousand dollars. If you want it space qualified for for a space mission then uh, uh, you can go up to, uh, uh, I think for UVIT, we spent about $6 million. So uh, the, the basic technology is that uh, you, you have a photocathode and depending on what wavelengths you want to observe, you use different photocathodes. So if you use something like potassium bromide photocathode, that will cut off at about 1800 angstroms. It's uh, uh, the, the work function is high enough that you won't get any photons a long word of 1800 angstroms. If you use uh, uh, something like uh, uh, cesium telluride, that'll get you up to about 3200 angstroms. So you, you're starting to get the tail end of the, of the solar spectrum. If you wanna go into the visible, then you can use something like an S20 photocathode, which will get you all the way up to, up to 9000 angstroms. But basically you have a photocathode, a photon from uh, space comes and hits it. 
and then you're accelerated by uh, about 200 volts to the surface of a, of a microchannel plate, and then uh, through about 5,000 volts through the uh, different stages of the microchannel plate. Typically, we, we use three-stage microchannel plates, and I'll show you the output uh, later. And then, uh, uh, you, so you convert one photon coming in into maybe uh, 100,000 uh, electrons at the, at the other end. And the way we do it for UVIT is that we have a, a phosphor screen and uh, the photons from that phosphor screen are sent through a fiber optic taper to a, a CMOS sensor. And so uh, depending on where it hits in the sky, you get a burst of light on your CMOS sensor. So we're converting uh, photons into uh, into signal on the photon, I mean, on the, on the CMOS sensor. Uh, something like Galax used, uh, the, uh, used this cross delay line detector. And this uh, is from uh, uh, Aussie Sigmund. It's, uh, it's been their biggest, uh, biggest seller. And so instead of, having, instead of having to convert the electrons into back into photons, what you do is you measure the charge directly. And uh, in this one, you have a, a set of wires in one a set of wires in one direction, and you have a single long wire in another direction. So, based on the delay between uh, when you measure the uh, uh, the charge cloud on one side or the other, you'll get uh, you can tell the uh, where on this long strip it fell, and you get the y position from which one of these green strips the charge falls on. So again, you get a two-dimensional picture of the sky. And you get a two-dimensional re recording of where the photon hits. Now, uh, this is just uh, uh, different types of, uh, of photocathodes. So depending on, on what wavelength you're interested in, as I said, you can use different photocathodes. Now, what you actually do is that you measure the X and Y position of each photon, and you measure the pulse height and then you measure the time. And this is where you get the big difference between a UVIT type detector, where you have a CMOS sensor, and a Galax type detector where you have the electronic detector, which is in the, uh, uh, in the recording time. So for UVIT, what happened was because we had the CMOS sensor, we read the CMOS sensor at 25 frames a second. And so you would integrate every photon that you get in that, uh, in that uh, uh, 125th of a second. With, uh, with an instrument like Galax, where you have uh, this uh, a delay line detector, you, your counting time is, is uh, your response time is much better. Uh, you, you record each photon with, uh, with, with a few tens of nanosecond accuracy. And so you don't saturate as fast. So what happens is that you measure the uh, pulse height, and this is your typical distribution from any one of these intensified detectors. So this, uh, this first peak here is uh, uh, basically from Cherenkov radiation in your uh, MCP. And so this is, uh, this is all junk. This is your noise. So when you send up your MCP, and this typically the manufacturer will do for you, you buy a detector and your manufacturer will set your threshold for, for the particular detector you have. And they would set it somewhere around here so that you exclude all of the noise and you just measure the, uh, uh, the, detected, uh, the detected photons, uh, the detected photons. Uh, if you, the, the number of stages of your MCP will define the, uh, the spread of this. And so typically we would use a three-stage MCP. Now the trouble is that uh, as you get more and more, if you, get, if, you would get, if you get multiple photons hitting the same pixel, then uh, hitting, hitting the same pixel at the same time, then it gets very hard to differentiate them. So you can't really differentiate between one photon or two photons or three photons. You can try, but it gets more and more difficult. Uh, and so, the, uh, so this is the advantage of, of something like Galax. So when you're looking at the total efficiency of the detector, we measure the quantum th throughput. And so 
you have uh, typically 80% reflectivity for the mirror. Typically you have two mirrors, maybe three mirrors. And so two mirrors already gives you 60% uh, efficiency. And then you put a filter in and you're down to 50%. And then your detector is about a 10% efficiency, anywhere from five to 10%. And this hasn't really changed over the last uh, 40 years. And, and this is where much of the new technology is, is coming in. We have a collaboration with uh, the University of Tübingen, Nor Norbert Kappelmann, where they're putting, where they're giving us detectors with maybe a 40% efficiency. And so if you, if you do that, now obviously you, you increase the total number of uh, counts that you detect. So for UVIT or for Galax, the total system efficiency was somewhere around 5%. So you would only detect 5% of the photons that come in. And uh, uh, yeah, so you detect about 5% of the photons that you come in, that, that come in. So that's the QT. And then if you want to measure the total number of counts, and this is the, one of the big things about UV astronomy or X-ray astronomy, we actually do measure every single count. So uh, uh, you, your, uh, uh, yeah, you measure every count that comes in. And so your counts are just your, the flux in, in counts, again, in photons, the flux in photons, times your mirror area, times uh, the, uh, uh, the width of your, of your instrument, the, uh, the spectral width of your instrument, times the QT. And so for uh, UVIT, Typically, this whole conversion factor is something like 10 to the minus 15. So uh, that gives you a measure of how bright the stars are that you measure. Now, uh, people do try to talk about magnitudes in the ultraviolet, but I'm, I'm not a great believer in that because uh, magnitudes get to be a, a matter of definition. You can use, uh, there are different magnitude systems coming around or going around. And, uh, uh, the, the optical magnitude system has no real meaning because A0 stars like Vega have no flux in the UV. So you can't take a ratio to them. So what Galax did was that they, they used the Johnson magnitudes. And so that is defined in, in, in this way. Uh, you, you have the slides, you can, you can see them later. So it's defined in this way. And the limiting magnitude for, for Galax was about 20th magnitude in a hundred second observation. Now, because we're, uh, we're doing photon counting, this gives you a, an easy scale factor. So Galax had about a 50 centimeter mirror. And if you want, to, uh, if you increase the area by a factor of 10, then you increase your, uh, the, the, your signal to noise by a factor of, of, of about three. If you go from a hundred second observation to a thousand second observation, again, you increase the, uh, uh, their signal to noise by about three. So uh, it's photon statistics. So you, you take your, your, your error is, is the square root of the number of counts. So if you're getting a hundred count or if you're getting a hundred counts in a in hundred seconds, then uh, in a thousand seconds, you'll get a thousand counts. Your, your uh, signal to noise will go up by, by the square root of 10, three. Because these are all zero, zero noise instruments, typically the noise that you're looking at is five counts per square centimeter of detector. So because your noise is, uh, is close to zero, your every photon that you get is really photons from the source. And so all you have to fight is the, is the background. You have the, uh, the diffuse galactic background, you might have air glow, uh, zodiacal light, whatever else it is. Uh, and so if you're looking at a, at a point source, if you look at it for a thousand seconds, you can look at it for 10,000 seconds and you'll increase your signal to noise by, by, by a factor of uh, square root of three. So when you look at count rates, very often the count rates you're looking at in, in, are a hundredth of a count per pixel per second. So it's just because you're integrating over a thousand seconds or over 10,000 seconds. So if over 10,000 seconds, you get 10 counts, that's a, uh, that's a three sigma observation. Okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's basically what I said here. 
So if you get uh, 20th magnitude in uh, in 100 second 100 seconds, that's the uh, Galax All Imaging Survey, then you get about 23rd magnitude in uh, 30,000 seconds. This is the Deep Imaging Survey. Now the uh, 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 one of the problems with these intensified detectors is that uh, the the lifetime of your uh, microchannel plate is is limited to about one coulomb. You can draw about one coulomb of charge from that. So most UV missions avoided bright regions, particularly in the beginning of a mission. And so for uh, uh, missions for for uh, uh, for sensors with a large field of view like Galax with this one degree field of view, you might even get enough diffuse background that, uh, that, that, that uh, you, you'll saturate your field. And uh, they're, they're only a countable number of hot stars. So it's, it's fairly easy to avoid the hot stars. You know where they are. And so typically these missions have avoided the galactic plane and they've avoided the Magellanic clouds. So uh, they've avoided many of the most interesting areas in uh, in the sky. As Galax uh, aged in its last uh, year or uh, two years of, of, of its life, then you're not so worried about, about its lifetime. So, so they went down and observed a significant fraction of the galactic plane. Unfortunately, by that time, the far ultraviolet detector had already failed. So there's mostly, uh, uh, there's uh, NUV observations of most of the galactic plane. Now, the impact of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, the, the difference between the CMOS sensor that we have in UVIT and the uh, uh, electronic detectors that they have in Galax is the nonlinearity. It's a dynamic range. So your faintness limit is more or less the same. UVIT is more or less 20th magnitude uh, within a factor of two, let's say, of Galax. The FUV is a factor of two worse. The sensitivity is a factor of two lower in UVIT. The NUV is about the same. But the brightness limit in UVIT, because you're integrating over 1 25th of a second, you start to saturate. And so this is uh, observations of brighter and brighter stars. If you're, if you're purely linear, this is what you would expect. But as you start to get count rates near 20 frames, uh, 20 counts a second. I uh, remember UVIT samples 25 times a second. As you get to count rates near your sampling rate, you start to saturate. And, uh, and so you can't observe, your, your dynamic range is, is only uh, about uh, five or six magnitudes. All right, uh, let me skim through this. So the main difference between Galax and UVIT, uh, Galax had two filters. Uh, the res spatial resolution of Galax was maybe five to 10 arc seconds, depending on, uh, on where, you, where, where you looked. UVIT had uh, multiple filters and uh, we got down to uh, uh, about one and a half arc second resolution. So when we were talking about doing Galax in, uh, in I mean, this is the way it works. Uh, we started talking about it in the late 80s. And uh, when, when I went to IA in, in 2000, that's when uh, it was first, that was when it was accepted. And it finally flew in 2015. So when it flew in 2000, this was before Galax. And so uh, uh, we, we thought, what will make us unique? And the one and a half arc second resolution, close to ground-based resolution, was something that, that did separate UVIT. In many cases, it may not make a difference. If you're looking at a star formation region with a width of, uh, of five arc seconds, it, it doesn't matter if you look at it with one and a half arc second or five arc second resolution. But there are places where, where you really do need that resolution. So uh, the UV, UVIT is still up there and it's still taking observations. And I'll talk about it a little bit, not very much, but uh, Galax has uh, uh, stopped working in 2013. And so all of the Galax data are available from MAST. And so this is uh, uh, Luciana uh, Bianchi has been working on the, uh, getting all the point sources out of, uh, out of Galax. And so what she's done here is she's taken the, uh, uh, the SDSS 
uh, she's cross-indexed Galax with SDSS. And so you can do all sorts of, uh, of uh, photometric, uh, you know, photometric spectroscopy with this. You can separate things out by, by uh, separate out quasars. The, adding the UV to your, uh, adding, adding the UV to the, to the SDSS bands makes a huge difference. We've done some of it, I've done some of it, but uh, never, never just gotten very far. Uh, what I've done is I've looked at all of the diffuse ultraviolet observations. And so all of these available, all of these data are available from the, uh, from the high level science products at, at Space Telescope. And so this is the FUV diffuse map of the sky and the NUV diffuse map of the sky. Uh, the large scale uh, distribution of the of the galactic of the of the scattered light is essentially it's a cosecant distribution as anything to do with the galaxy is, but it has a background of uh, or a baseline of about 200 photon units at uh, at the, at the galactic poles, and just for reference, 200 photon units it's uh, uh, photons per centimeter squared per second per radian per angstrom. And uh, one 100 photon units is uh, two nanowatts per meter squared per steradian, which is typically what they use in the extragalactic background. <clears throat> so you see the large scale effects, much brighter in the galactic poles, much faint, I'm much brighter as you get towards the galactic plane, much fainter as you get towards the galactic poles. Uh, in the, as you get closer, as you get to lower and lower latitudes, most of this is uh, scattered starlight from interstellar dust. At the poles, it's a more complex mix of extragalactic light. About a third of it is uh, scattered starlight, and uh, some part of it we just don't know. And you can also see the small scale effects. So this bright region here is Spica. The star itself is not absorbed because it's too bright for galaxies, but there's a halo about five uh, degrees in size of uh, scattered radiation around Spica. And just to put this in the context of the extragalactic light, this is the ultraviolet background here, and this is the optical background here. All right, so let me uh, end up by just uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, what, what we're doing and where we, about a couple of the instruments that are up. So right now, HST is, uh, is doing the, is the workhorse of the, of the UV community with uh, COS, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. And UVIT is uh, is still up there. It's uh, we we had two instruments, the NUV and the FUV. The far ultraviolet, uh, uh, I mean the near ultraviolet instrument has failed now, but we're still taking FUV data of the sky. It's uh, been up now for uh, it, this will be its sixth year, and so you know how long will it stay up? And once that's done, then there's no UV capability. The next missions that are planned is the World Space Observatory. This is a 1.7 meter telescope and it'll do uh, uh, high to moderate resolution spectroscopy. Uh, it's planned for a 2025 launch. Ultrasat, uh, I think that was planned for a 2024 launch. And this actually is uh, where Sri and I first started talking about uh, UV astronomy. And uh, it, at that time, it was supposed to be a low cost mission to do UV astronomy. It, it turns out to be a little more expensive than that, but that's a large field of view, I think 200 square degrees. And they'll uh, look at the sky and get continuous UV alerts. And that now is a Israeli, a Weizmann Institute and uh, Desi, uh, Germany, uh, who's providing the detector collaboration. Okay, what happened? Okay. And uh, uh, there's a couple of smaller missions that are going up. Uh, NASA has uh, decided to put some, some energy into doing CubeSats. And so it, right now it's still an experimental program. They're putting money into CubeSats and hoping that they, that they work. And so one of them is CUTE, the Colorado Ultraviolet Transit Experiment. And that uh, will fly, I mean, it was supposed to fly last year. Now they say this year, who knows, maybe next year. But what that will do is it'll take atmospheres of exoplanets with a small mirror, a 30 centimeter mirror. And uh, the, it's actually a rectangular mirror, 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter mirror. 
And so what they do is that uh, they look at, uh, they, they want to look at giant planets uh, in eclipse against the star. And these giant planets have huge atmospheres. And so you can see the, uh, you, you can see atmospheric uh, lines from those planets against the surf, against the star. Uh, we have, uh, I'm, I'm not really going to, I'm not going to talk about the bigger missions. There's uh, LUVOR, which is a, a huge mission that they wanted to, that, that's something that I think will be in the, uh, in the Academy report. It's, it's as a, as a, in the National Academy report. That's a, a eight meter mirror, and they're going to do all sorts of great stuff. LUVOR all the way from the UV to the infrared. There's uh, INSIST, which is a proposal that's been put into ISRO that's now going through phase A study where they want to do a one and a half meter mirror down to uh, uh, better than an arc second resolution. But what we're doing with, with my group is that we, we're, we're working more on the small, small instruments. And so we have one that's going to fly in the Chinese space station in 2023. And this is part of a UN program what happened was that uh, they had a proposal to to you could you could propose to do things on the Chinese space station. So you provide all you build your instrument, and then they give you a free launch. <laughs> so what we're going to do, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to sit on the space station, and as the space station goes around the Earth, uh, we and, and the Earth goes around the Sun, we'll scan uh, a line of uh, of latitude. <clears throat> and where it's a it's a spectrograph, a low resolution spectrograph between 1600 and uh, and 3000 angstroms, with a resolution of about four angstroms or so. So if we 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 will if we can we'll do things like mapping the uh, uh, nebular emission from from supernovae. We had another mission that was uh, that we'd done in in collaboration with the university that uh, uh, is, uh, uh, it's, a, it's got a three degree field of view and it's a near UV instrument between 1600 and 3000 angstroms, a photon counting instrument. And so we were going to launch it on a dedicated satellite and, and just let it sit up there and observe the sky, get whatever, uh, observe whatever it gets down to a, a sensitivity limit of about 20th magnitude. And uh, uh, that, that mission sort of fell through because the university failed. The university just uh, ran out of funding. So now what we're doing is we're, we're ho hoping that we get on a PS4 launch, which is this uh, uh, ISRO, they, they're flying their PSLVs and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the third stage is just gonna sit up in orbit until it decays. And so they're uh, offering the chance to put your payload on that, uh, on that platform. But what I wanted to highlight here is that the total cost of the mission is about $30,000. And one graduate student did it from, from uh, start to finish. So uh, when I started in, uh, in space astronomy, we were talking about anything from 30 million to $100 million launch, uh, I mean, uh, mission plus, plus the launch cost. So now, this is uh, we, we can we can do it for 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 much less, and uh, and so the, what you're still struggling with is is getting it into space. So I think the baseline number now is still about a hundred thousand dollars per kg. Maybe you can get it down to thirty thousand dollars per kg. But uh, uh, so if I want to launch a twenty kg payload, I might uh, that might cost me a million dollars. But really. If you want to do uh, uh, science at a low cost, I think uh, the ultraviolet is is really the way to go. You can it, it's stuff that you can't do from the ground, but it's stuff that's easy to design because it's very similar to stuff that you can do from the ground, and uh, and you can put up uh, small mirrors, maybe even even a, a ten centimeter mirror, uh, maybe a three U satellite, and. Uh, just, just do something like uh, observe Proxima Centauri for six months or stare at the Magellanic Clouds for, for six months. And because you can do it for so cheap, uh, you can, you can uh, when I was talking to Israel, they said, look, if you can build one for $30,000, why don't we fly one? And if it works, then, then build 10 of them. 
and we'll we'll send ten of them up. So so I think there uh, that, that more than any other field, the UV is where you can go for niche science, good science, but but niche at uh, at a reasonable cost. So uh, let me end there and uh, open it up for discussions. Okay, very good. Uh, so the way we'll do it is, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, and when your question has been answered, lower your hand, okay? <clears throat> so uh, um, uh, questions, please. Okay, while you're getting ready, thinking about it, uh, I just, uh, ah, I see a question, Josh. Josh Blue. Thanks very much for the talk. Can you say a bit more about timing of the arrival of the photons, how, how um, precise can we get at, at measuring that? I assume it's faster than uh, 25 Hertz or the resolution better than, than 1 25th of a second. Yeah, so uh, if you, for, for UVIT, the problem is just our integration time. The integration time of the CMOS sensor was, tw was uh, 25 frames a second. So for there, you it you it doesn't do much good to do. I mean, it doesn't do you any good to do better. But if you do have uh, uh, an, uh, uh, one of these uh, delay line detectors, for instance, then you can easily put an onboard uh, detector. I mean, onboard uh, clock, uh, integrate a clock with your instrument, uh, and uh, and then tie it to your spacecraft clock. So what we were going to do with with Tavix, which was a wedge and strip detector. Was we put out a clock signal every, uh, uh, you know, I can't remember every microsecond or so, and we would sync up with the spacecraft clock. It, Chris can probably tell you more about how it was done for Galax and what the timing resolution was for Galax. Great, thank you. But yeah, you can do you can do well. Um. Josh, if you're done, uh, can you lower your hand? Just so I know it's not a new question. Okay, um, other questions? Um, so I'm adding one again while waiting for people to compose their questions. Uh, Jayant, there's a approved mission called Dorado. It had a different name, Gucci, something else before. So you mm -hmm. may have lost track of the name, but it is a, uh, so, uh, you, you know, that's uh, 2025. It's in the small sat mission uh, thing. If you want, I can send you a little double A stock on that. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> okay. One of the things that I, that I, I just want, let me just, why, why is it 2025? Because, uh, you know, you can do it much faster now. Uh, I think you're asking the wrong person to justify anything about <laughs> the current system. I mean, if you, as you well know, I'm the ultimate anarchist. So asking an anarchist to explain the system, I don't think is a good idea. I can simply say people are stupid, but that's not how, it, uh, I don't think that'd be very helpful. So, okay. Uh, Let's see, how do I type a message to everyone here? Okay, uh, any other questions? I have a question. Um, you mentioned the, the work that has been done by Luciana on uh, um, the so, uh, point sources with Galax. I was wondering if there has been something like that with UVIT as well, and if it's it would be um, it's what we could learn from that kind of um, that kind of study differently from what's been done from Galax. Yeah, so uh, one of the uh, I'm going to be a little politically incorrect here. One of the problems with UVIT is that they don't have enough uh, UV astronomers in in there. So many of the programs that are being done for UVIT are direct translations of optical programs. And so uh, there, there isn't much there. there uh, I, I think that what should be done with UVIT now is a dedicated program to, to uh, do the stuff that Galax couldn't do. 
a lot of the stuff that's being done with the UVIT now is the stuff that Galax did, but only a little bit better. And with a little more imagination, I, I think that, uh, uh, that they should really do much newer science. I don't know how much of your question I answered. <laughs> Enough. Uh, so is the archival data for UVT uh, all available? And yes. Yes, it's available from the Indian Space Science Data Center. Thank you. It's uh, a little hard to get, it's a little hard to analyze the stuff because the software pipeline doesn't work. So yeah, you, you talk to me, I've written my own pipeline for it. So you have to contact someone <laughs> yeah. to get it to work. Okay, thank you. Yes, please so, go ahead. So, uh, I, so you said uh, Galax did not observe a bright diffuse sources because uh, uh, detector will uh, saturate. If, is it possible to uh, observe such kind of uh, diffuse sources by uh, with uh, CCD or CMOS? I think that can that will not affect by the uh, saturation or something like MCP. Yeah, so I think that's the biggest problem with the CCDs or CMOS based the intensified detectors, the CCD CMOS detectors. It's just that you're not going to get the dynamic range. So you either choose to observe faint sources or you choose to observe bright sources. It's hard to switch between the two. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay, um, other questions? So I posted the Dorado AA stock of Brad Senko. I saw it, yeah. Yeah, anyway, we'll get a talk on Dorado and its status maybe a month from now from the PI himself. Yeah. Uh, and um, we'll also get a talk from Yatsu-san who just asked a question, who's a PI of a Japanese small satellite mission also, but uh, fortunately going uh, only end of next year, but we'll get that in about a month's time. Yeah. Um, I did want to say uh, something, it's a little technical, but Jayant will probably like it. So for some of the experts, they, and maybe it's a bit useful. So uh, the problem, it's true that the photon counting detectors have very low read noise, uh, sorry, very low dark current, but they do have dark current. And if you don't use it, or if it is high, or you don't, if you don't correctly map the, the dark current in, is physical. That is, it's something like electrons per second per square centimeter, okay? Whereas the pixels are optical, you have to convert, there's a scale factor between the pixel and uh, you know, and if you do it incorrectly, let's say for some reason you set your pixel as one milli arc second, right? Uh, and that corresponds to let's say one millimeter. That's a bad idea, I think. Okay. Uh, so I want to share my screen here and just go through an elementary exercise. I was trying to understand. Let me stop my screen share. I think yeah. I have to do that. Okay, got it. Okay, so let me sh uh, tell you this calculation. <coughs> okay, uh, sorry, it may be a little technical. Anyway, I, I, wrote the, I, I investigated STIS. Okay, we start off with the diffuse background that Jan talked about, which I put as 300 CU, which in the language of UV astronomy is photons per square centimeter per second per angstrom per star radian, which I've forgotten here. <laughs> okay, and you can convert that if you wish to a, a per arc second. Uh, if you use AB units, simply because there's no, you know, if you're going to switch to some magnitude, you might as well switch to something that's easy to always convert. So I'm switching to AB magnitude, which is just setting, I forget whatever it is, 37, 3437, something 34, approximately 3400 Jansky is a zero point. Okay, so the, the, this is the point Jant was making. The UV sky is 20, is very faint. So if, even if you look in AB units and which, you know, uh, because many of you are familiar with the optical stuff, well, that is pretty impressively faint, okay? But now let's go to STIS, okay? And this is what uh, Jant was talking about where, you know, you get the reflection and there's this offset, okay? And that's a minimum I used and it's a very famous paper by Bob O'Connell about this, this rather stunningly small number or faint. But let's look at STIS. 
which carries one of these uh, <clears throat> electronic detectors, and it's nothing to do with electronic detectors, but it just has dark current, okay? Uh, and the dark current itself, uh, when you run it for time t, you get d times t photoelectrons. And let's say it's stable, therefore the uncertainty on that is what matters, it's square root of d times t, and then you can convert that to a surface brightness. Okay, so if you do this for stis imaging, uh, now it does sort of matter because maybe in stis imaging, you can take advantage of the fact Hubble is a diffraction limited telescope. And so you really can go to a 25 milli arc second pixel and do things. It is 23.5 AB magnitude per square arc second, okay? And, uh, and then it will decrease with time uh, as a square root of time because the dark current is, okay? I'm just talking about the, the background here, okay? So, um, but if you look at this UV, FUV spectroscopy on the other hand, because of the way things are mapped, okay, the, the, the pixels are not very well mapped to taking advantage of the diffraction limited. Now you find something very interesting that uh, for essentially the STIS FUV spectral background that is per extraction element is 17th magnitude now, okay? Uh, and this, this eta percent is turns out to be for space telescope. That is the mirror plus whatever else, plus this, plus the quantum efficiency. This turns out to be over 3% maximum. Okay, it's not in the five that Janet was talking about. Um, but remember, this was built, I don't know, the previous century actually, and went up in 98. So, you know, you was state of the art at some point. So you can see that this is this is much worse than, so there's no comparison between the background you're getting for spectroscopy for imaging compared to the natural sky by a long, long shot. Anyway, Janet, I was wondering if you had something to say about that. You're muted, I think. Yeah, I saw. So if you're, uh, uh, if the, this Tom Brown had done a study of the UV background with, uh, with STIS back in, in uh, 2000 or so. And yeah, you're, you're, uh, you get down to maybe, we, we would like to get down to, to a couple of hundred photon units with STIS or with FUSE, we were getting down to about 2000 photon units. Yeah. So, what about UVIT? Do, does it do a better job here? Of the UV background? Yeah. No, it won't because uh, it, it's got uh, smaller pixels. Ah, okay. So that's... So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but, uh, okay. Any other questions? Well, um... Um, so I think if there are no other questions, I think we can, uh, Ilari, I think we can wrap it up, isn't it? Sure, I uh, will stop recording then.